Hello. Today we are going to start with our first lecture from the Windows Networking Unit, specifically Network Shares. And we're going to talk about resource sharing and folder sharing. So we've got a couple of different sharing models that Windows Networking uses. By default, every Windows workstation is configured for peer-to-peer -peer sharing method based on the work group. Um, and if you are, if you go into your settings, you will see that your computer is in a work group named work group. So that if you set up all of your computers, um, you know, like if you and your friends all set up your computers together on the same network and they all have the right IP addressing scheme, you would essentially all be in a work group together, a peer to peer networking work group, and you could start sharing folders and sharing resources without doing any kind of peer to peer setup because it is by default, there is a work group named work group <laughs> in Windows. Um, but if you are going to change and set up a work group or come out of a domain and go into a work group and you want to set up peer to peer networking, um, there are some rules. One, all systems in a work group must be on the same local network. So they all have to have the same IP addressing scheme. They have to be local. It can't be a wide area network. Each computer has its own list of user accounts called local user accounts. So there's no domain controller on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, locally, um, each computer has local user accounts, just like on your lab computers before installing Active Directory, you all had local user accounts. Um, and then each computer is able to choose what it shares and with whom. And then if you are going to be in different work groups, so you want to have two work groups in the same local area network, which is certainly doable, you can have 10 work groups in the same local area network, because as you remember, local area networks can be quite big. You can, you just have to make sure that everybody in the work group, the work group has the same name. So, you know, you can have one work group named um, Homer and one work group named Bart and one work group named Maggie and one work group named whatever the mom's name is because I can't think of the mom's name right now. Domains are different. Domains are for client server networks. They're centrally managed and they're managed from one or more Windows servers. Domains can have thousands of computers and they can be spread across multiple local network segments as long as all client systems can communicate with their servers. So they don't have to all be in the same local area network. They can be in a big wide area network. There just has to be a way for them to communicate with the server. Domains are centrally administrated from servers and in general, only business editions of Windows can join domains. So you can't join a domain while um, if you're using Windows Home Edition. With a domain-based account, you can log um, onto any computer on the domain, whether or not you have a local account on the system, which is a big difference from peer-to-peer. -peer. <coughs> In peer-to-peer -peer networking, excuse me, you have to have a local account to log into that system. In domain networking, you can log into any system there are some limitations that you can set. You can set it uh, as a network administrator. You can set certain systems so that only certain people can log into them. But in general, you can log into any system on the domain um, if it's just set up as a regular domain computer, except domain controllers, um, regardless of whether you have a local account on the system. The resources that are shared by each computer on the domain they can be shared whether it's a client or a server, and they are centrally controlled by administrators. So I can share some files on the server, I can share some files on a client computer, and I, as the administrator, control the whole thing. And I give all the permissions for it and everything. And then domain users typically have limited per permissions to change system settings. So remember, uh, when we first talked about peer-to-peer -peer networking and um, 
domain uh, uh, client server networking. Peer to peer requires more training for your users, but client server doesn't require as much training because you just limit the permissions and um, stuff of what they can do. So you don't have to train them to do things because you do it usually remotely or through group policy um, on your si system, which we'll get into later, um, or things like that. There's so many things you can do centrally from your server. It is really kind of awesome. So in Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, um, Microsoft tried their home version of work groups called home groups. And so if you've got a Windows 7, or an 8 or an 8.1 system, they can join home groups. And home groups were basically, the purpose of them was to share things like pictures and videos and printers on home networks. Um, generally, you create, uh, one user creates the home group and then anybody else gets to join it by, um, as long as they have the shared pass group, password. And then computers already in work groups can create or join home groups. So you can be in a work group and in a home group. Home and business edition of Windows can join home groups, but Windows server editions might not be able to. Probably wouldn't have any reason to, to be honest. Each user on the home group can choose whether to share any of a list of commonly shared items, such as photos, videos, music, or printers. So you can share your pictures, but not your music. And you can share your printers and your videos, but not your embarrassing pictures. So it's up to you. Computers on a home group continue to use their local or their domain accounts. So they can be in a domain, they can be in a home group, they can be in a work group. All Well, they can't be in a domain and a work group at the same time. So they can be in a domain and a home group in the same time or a work group in a home group at the same time. Unlike work groups and domains, home groups don't have unique names. It's just you have to be together on the same network and then you have to have the password. So if you want to join a work group or a domain, you go to your system control panel and then you click change settings in the computer name, domain and work group settings. In the computer name tab of system properties, window, you click change, and then you make the desired change. Um, you can do a couple of different things. You can change the computer's name. You can change from a domain to a work group or from a work group to a domain. Um, you can run a domain name wizard. I usually don't do that. I find that wizard fails more often than just doing it manually and manually is much easier. One thing to note is that you cannot like change a computer's name and join a work group or a domain at the same time. You have to do one or the other because the name has to be established before you join a domain. Because when you join the domain, you're actually making a computer account in that domain. Now, if you're joining a domain, you're going to be prompted for a username and password. And that username and password has to be an administrator's username and password on the domain. They have to be a member of the domain administrator group on the domain. So you can't just have any person willy-nilly come in and join your domain. You don't have to worry about that. Only administrators can join domains. And then you restart your computer for it to take effect. You also have to restart your computer after a name change. And um, this is the same way that you can change your name on your server. Now, you can be like um, super user and use the net dom command most people though are just going to use the gui there are, but the net dom command is something that once you are a more advanced user you may choose to use command line um, commands because they usually are faster than wizards um, net dom add lets you um add uh, an account to the domain net dom computer name lets you um Add a computer to the domain. NetDom rename computer lets you rename a computer. NetDom join lets you join the domain. NetDom move lets you move from one domain to another domain. 
Net DOM remove removes you from the domain. Net DOM query lets you ask questions of the domain. Net DOM resets sort of resets your domain um, uh, relationship. Every once in a while, you get this weird error, and it's one way to reset your trust relationship. And then, if you don't know what a command means, you can always go net dom help. So, like, if you didn't know what net dom query meant, you could go net dom help query, and you would get an explanation of that. Now, do I expect you to remember all of that? No, but you should understand that a lot of the things on a server that you can do with the GUI with a graphical user interface wizard you can do on a command prompt and as you become a more advanced user you will want to learn how to do things from the command prompt so every network you join has a location type and it's really important in terms of network security a lot of times when you log on to a new network, particularly if it's a Wi-Fi network, you get a little box that'll pop up and it's gonna ask you, depending on your operating system, if it's a public network or a private network. If it's a public network, um, it's going to be, uh, there's gonna be a lot more higher security settings on it. If it's a private network, then the security settings are not going to be as high because the assumption is you know the other computers that are lurking around and the other users that are lurking around on your network. So if you're connected to a domain, generally you don't have control over that setting at all. The network administrator does. But if you're not on a domain, you can choose whether you're public or private. The public location disables most work group and home group sharing features and then um, plugs some of the ports in Windows Firewall. So Windows Firewall will use stricter rules as far as what can come, what ports are open. Um, private work and home locations. So you're going to see private on Windows 10. You're going to see work and home on Windows 7 and 8 and 8.1. They all tell Windows Firewall to use less restrictive settings. And so they open more ports. Um, and then if you've got any particular ports that you've opened, it'll be in there. Um, and then it it also allows you to do uh, more um, sharing, home sharing things that you can't do on the, on the public one. Public and private locations are separately configurable in other network security settings in the control panels. So to change network locations, this is what you do. In Windows 7, you just go network locations in the network and sharing center to open the set network locations window. In Windows 8, you go PC settings to network to connections, click on the network that you're connected to, um, find the devices and content. You switch on for private networks and off for public networks. In Windows 10, it's very similar to Windows 7. It's settings, network, and internet, and then status, and change connection properties. And you then just choose public or private. Um, in Windows 7, you're choosing between among public, pri uh, home, and work. But in Windows 10, you're choosing between public and private. If you're in a home group now and you want to create or join a home group, basically um, you get a, you um, make sure that your network location is set to home or private, and then you go to network and internet to home group. And if you're going to create a home group, you just run the create a home group wizard, and then at the end it gives you a chance to have a passcode to create a passcode. And then um, you give the passcode out to anybody else in your um, area that you want to join the home group. Now, if you're joining a home group, um, follow the on-screen instructions, and then it will detect that a home group has been created on your network. And um, then you give the password. You then say, these are the things that I want to be able to share. You know, they can see these, but not that. And then you save changes and Bob's your uncle, you're in your home group. 
Now, one of the things that we do with our servers, and it's one of the main roles of servers, is file sharing, so that you are able to collaborate with other people on the files, especially in the workplace. So there are a variety of ways in which you can share folders in a work group environment. There are shared folders, there are mapped network drives, there are public folders, home group folders, and administrative shares. So in Windows Explorer, you can browse the network. And when you browse the network, if I don't know if you've ever done that, uh, if you click network, so you're, sit, you're in Windows Explorer and you click on network, and then you should see a list of all of the computers that are in your network. If you double click on each computer, it will navigate to anything in that computer that they have shared. Now you may or may not have permission to access the stuff that is in those shares, But double, double clicking on them will usually tell you. <laughs> if you double click on it and it tells you you have no access, then flat out you have no access. If you double click on it, you open it and there's nothing in it. It may mean that there's nothing in it or it may mean that you have no access. So um, that's one way to get into shared folders. Another way to get into shared folders is you can use what's called a UNC or a Universal Naming Convention path name. And that's what's shown here on the bottom of the screen. Come on, I want to use the highlighter. Computer name resource path. So it's WAC WAC, name of computer or name of server, WAC resource path. So I can share a folder on my server named teacher and then if you want to get to that folder as long as you're in my network all you have to do is go to your run command hit win or you know just hit windows key r bring up your run command and hit whack whack so backslash backslash teacher because that was the name of my server and then backslash and then I would give you the path to that folder. So if I just, I'm, let's say I just put it in my C drive, then all you'd have to put, do is whack, whack, computer name, teacher, whack, name of folder. And let's say it was stuff. I just, I just the share was named stuff. Whack, whack, teacher, whack, stuff. And you would be there. You wouldn't have to, it wouldn't matter whether I put it in C, D, E, F, Z, double A, or quiddlybum, as long as <laughs> that folder is shared and that sh share has a name and I have given that, sh that UNC path name to uh, whoever I want to share it with and given them permission to, sh to use it, they can access it through a UNC path name. You can use that same process anywhere else that uses the Windows Explorer file browser, such as in the open command or in save as or in Windows. So you don't have to use if if you are going to save something in a network share, you can use the UNC path name, the whack whack name of folder, whack pathway to share um, to get there. And then some applications integrate access to Windows shares in other ways. They'll actually put the network browser in the side, which makes it even handier. So you don't have to remember the UNC path name. You can just go down to the network, um, uh, the network browser and find the computer that it's on. And boop, there you go. You can get to it. And then it's just reminding you on the screen that just because a device appears on the network doesn't mean you can access it through Windows Explorer. Um, to access web configuration for devices like routers and network printers, you have to use your web browser instead. So um, two things, just because a device appears on a network doesn't mean you can access it through Windows Explorer. One, you may not have permission to because only certain people are gonna have permission to access things. And then two, if you're trying to access the interface of something, that's going to have to be accessed on 
a web configuration thing. So if you're trying to access the configuration for like a local router in a local office or a home office or in your home that you access through a web configuration, most printers you access through a web configuration and um, it, at least most contemporary printers, most newer printers are accessed through a web configuration. Now, let's say you use uh, one of those shares all the time and you don't want to have to type whack, whack, name of server, whack, name, pathway of share every single time you use it. Well, what you can do is you can just map a network drive. And you can tell that network drive to remap itself every time you log on. So um, all you have to do is you just go into Windows Explorer. And um, if you know you're going to be using a folder that is on the network all the time, you go to the server that it's on or the computer it's on in the network browser, right click on the folder that you use all the time, select map network drive. Then from the drive list, you just choose whatever drive letter you want to use, like U or Z or whatever. Um, and then check reconnected login if you want the share to be permanent, so rec recursive, so it's always there every single time you log back in. And then it, um, if you want to connect to the share as a different user, you actually can, but most of the time you don't want to. Then you click finish and it will be in your drive list from now on. So let's say you selected U as the drive letter. When you go to um, save something or open something, you no longer have to go whack, whack, name of server, whack, name of share. You just go U colon, bam, and you're in. So that's the benefit of mapping a network drive. <laughs> Excuse me. I am froggy today. So one of the um, things that I'm going to have you do in your labs is I'm going to have you share the folders so that you can get the experience of having um, shared folders. Home group sharing only allows you to choose whether it's read only or read write access where group work group sharing allows you to set more detailed users and permissions. So when you go to share, uh, you go to the folder itself. So you create a new folder, for example, name it stuff and things or whatever you want to name it. Name it Ruth Bader Ginsburg if you want to. I'm just looking at my Ruth Bader Ginsburg pop. You, um, open the file sharing windows. Um, and then in Windows 7, you just choose share with specific people in Windows 8 and later you click specific people on the share tab. And then in any version of the window, right click and choose share with specific people. If you're only sharing to your home group, choose home group read or home group read and write. You can't choose specific people. Choose who you wanna share with. If you're in a work group, click the arrow and select a local user. So it's going to be all local users. If you're on a domain, click the arrow and then select find people. And then you just do a little search and find the people you want to add. And then you choose the permissions for each user. Are you going to let them read? Are you going to let them read and write? Are you going to let them read, write, and execute? What are you going to let them do to everything in that folder? And then you click share you give the folder uh, usually it shares with whatever name you gave it but you can give it a different share name because sometimes the folders have a long name but you want the share name itself to be shorter um like say the folder is research and development files you might have the fair share name just be r and d with no spaces rand just makes it easier. Printers are shared in a very similar method. You can share a printer from its properties menu. So um, if you have a printer installed on your computer, you go to the printer and you click on it and select properties or right click on it and select properties. Um, in the sharing tab, you'll see a tab across the top that says sharing. Click share this printer, specify the share name. 
You can choose who you want to share it with if you want to. You do not have to. Most of the time, we just share it with whomever um, we give the share to. Uh, click additional drivers to install. So you um, might have older computers in your network. So if you got older computers in your network, you might have to install additional drivers. Um, if you don't have older computers in your network, you do not have to install additional drivers. And if everything is standardized, that's another benefit of standardization is you don't have to have a whole bunch of drivers. And then click OK. And then um, users will do the same thing. They can just browse the network, uh, double click on the computer that has that you is connected to, and they'll see the printer, double click on the printer, and it will install itself. Um, or they can do whack whack UNC path name, whack whack name of computer, whack name of printer. So whatever name you gave the printer. Usually the printer wants to name itself, so you got to kind of watch it. And then because it wants to name it HP LaserJet 19,027 named Fred. So um, you want to give it a shorter name if you're going to give people the UNC path name. So there's lots of things you can do with advanced sharing. You've got some options depending on your Windows edition. You can um, change the following options. So in Windows 7, you can configure network discovery to configure whether you can see or be seen by other computers on the network. Generally, if you are a server, you want to be seen by other people on the network. You can configure file and printer sharing to change whether your network shares can be accessed from other computers on the network. Remember, you still have to choose what folders to share. Um, file and print sharing is on by default on Windows Server 2019. I have noticed in the more, more recent versions, it didn't used to be on by default, but it makes sense that it is now. It is not on by default on Windows 10. But even though it's on, you still have to share devices if you are going, devices and folders if you are going to share them. The, it's just that the service has to be on in order for them to be accessible. You have to configure public folder sharing to choose whether network users can access public folders. And then you have to make sure that when you put things in public folders, they are indeed things you want to share. Um, you can click, this is still Windows 7, uh, choose media streaming options to select how other network devices can play streaming media from your libraries. You can configure file sharing connections to change encryption strength in network authentication. Configure password protection sharing to control whether network users must have local credentials on your computer, which is a good idea for them to have that. Configure home group connections, decide whether home group connections are allowed or whether all sharing is by work group methods. So you may not want in a small office users to enable home group. You can actually turn that off if you're using Windows 7. And some places are still using Windows 7, so it is not ridiculous to talk about Windows 7. Um, and by the way, some of this other stuff is available um, in other versions as well. Now, offline files are gonna be mainly an issue for people who are um, working with laptops, mobile devices, although um, now with VPNs and um, cloud computing and cloud storage, this is something that we don't really have to work, worry about so much anymore. Um, but you can make a network folder available offline from a client computer so that if you are taking your computer onto the plane, for example, um, all the files will automatically be downloaded before you log off of your server um, at the end of the day to your workstation or to your laptop. And then you can make any changes to them that you need to. Then when you go and log back into your network the next time, it will compare timestamps on the files and will merge 
um, and will overwrite the files. And then if there's any questions, it will not overwrite anything. Say if somebody else had gotten in and worked on it, it won't overwrite it then. And then you can go in and merge the files in that case. Um, in Windows 7, you can do that by going into the Sync Center and going to Always Available Offline. In Windows 8, 8, 1, or 10, go to Easy Access and go to Always Available Offline in the Home tab. Um, and that is, uh, <laughs> while well, you do that with the folders, the network folders. In any Windows version, right click a folder or file and choose Always Available Offline, which is the by far the easiest way to do it. If that option isn't available, then you do not have offline folders enabled, and so you need to do that. So once you've made folders available offline, you can view their status in the Sync Center to view sync results. Um, and then you can see any synchronizations or sync errors. And then to view sync conflicts, you can um, or click view sync conflicts and then you can see anything where there has been some conflicts and then you can decide which version you want to keep or you can compare the versions yourself. To switch file ac access to completely offline mode at any time in Windows 7, you can click work offline in Windows 8 and on up. Click easy access and make sure that the device is always available offline. And then manage offline files to change how Windows handles offline files. Use the general tab to enable offline files. Open the sync center or view offline files. So that's a lot about offline files. Use the disk usage tab to configure how much local space Windows will use for caching caching offline, not online files, offline files, because if you don't have enough, we want to make sure it doesn't take up your whole hard drive. Use the encryption tab to encrypt offline files in case your computer is ever lost or stolen, which may be, um, you know, offline files actually can be turned off by a network administrator. So, and encryption may be required by your network administrator. Use the network tab to configure how your computer manages files, shares over slow network connections. And then you can also use the Sync Center to synchronize files with compatible mobile devices. So that would be tablets and the, and the like. And then to do so, you connect the device and click set up a new sync partnership. So like I said, offline files are handy for devices like laptops, but really with cloud computing these days um, and with cloud storage like Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, all of that is handled for you. And you don't have to worry about the synchronization. Is this doing that? And is that doing this? And I have to go through all the managing of the synchronization. Most people just let a, a service handle it for them. So the net command. Again, as a network administrator, doing all this stuff can be done in the GUI, and that's going to be the easiest way at first. But after a while, you're going to look for a way to do it by writing scripts. Um, I know that I used to have a script that would run so that every time students logged in, it would log, it would map um, their Z drive to their folder online, so that anytime they save something into their Z drive, it, it when they needed to save something into their server, it would save it to the server, and would map the two printers in the room onto their computer and then it did one other thing and so i used the net share uh, or not the net share command but i used the net use command um, in a script and it made it really handy uh, so that the students never had to worry about mapping their own network drives and going out and finding their printer because they were already um already taken care of by the script and you do stuff like that so these are just common commands that you would use um, using the net command net share net use net view net file net sessions net account net computer net start net stop net pause and net continue whoa and these um 
commands are used mainly to create shares. So net share is will show you all your shares. Net use will allow you to um, create, uh, connect to shares uh, like map network drives, map printers. Um, net view lets you view any shares that are connected to you. I don't even remember what all of these are. Net start st starts command uh, starts um, services. Net stop stops services. Net pause pauses services. Net continues continues services. And so, um, you know, you're gonna use. I use like the top four and the bottom four. I don't really use net sessions, net accounts, and net computer. Um, I think those are Active Directory commands. And since I use Active Directory really only at the beginning of the year and to reset passwords, I never use command line things with it. So there you go. That is our lecture for today. I hope you made it all the way through it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.